concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2013, the First Minister signed the Edinburgh Agreement, which made clear that the referendum would deliver a result that everyone would respect. Now, we know the First Minister's pitch to voters this week to rerun not just one referendum, but two. Yep. I'm against that, but just out of interest, is she claiming to respect the results of any reruns, given she failed to last time? Yeah. First Minister. Well, of course, I'm glad that from that question, Ruth Davidson now appears to be conceding that the people of Scotland should get a choice of independence. Yeah. Obviously, the Prime Minister's change of heart on second referendums is catching presiding officer. But you know, let's look back to 2013 because in 2013 I seem to recall that one Ruth Davidson, uh, who may be recognised by many inside and outside this chamber, said to the people of Scotland uh, that we had to vote against independence to secure our place in the European yeah. Union. Yes. What is happening now? The people of Scotland face being taken out of the European Union against our will. Uh, but tomorrow, of course, in the most important European election in our country's history. People across Scotland have an opportunity to send a message and the message people in Scotland should take the opportunity to send is this one. Scotland's not for Brexit. Scotland is for Europe. Ruth Davidson. This isn't about respecting democracy or anything of the sort. This is about the First Minister using everything that she can lay her hands on to push for the only yeah. thing that she cares about. As she confirmed on the Andrew Marr programme at the weekend, even if the UK did vote to stay in the European Union, she'd still insist on rerunning the independence yeah. referendum. Yeah. This is about demanding more referendums until people are browbeaten into giving her the result that she wants. Yeah. Isn't it the case that she's only interested in democracy when it goes her way? Yeah. First Minister. The, the difference, perhaps, between Ruth Davidson and I is this. I, I've got principles, and I stick <laughs> to my principles. <laughs> Ruth Davidson wouldn't recognise a principle. You know, Ruth Davidson used to passionately oppose Brexit, now Ruth Davidson supports Brexit. She used to demand that we stayed in the single market. Now she wants us taken out of the single market. And Ruth Davidson, of course, uh, used to call Boris Johnson names that I can't repeat in this chamber. Now she's cozying up to Boris Johnson, the arch Brexiteer. Do you know, I can't help thinking that it is just a pity that flip-flopping is not an Olympic sport because Ruth Davidson would be a guaranteed gold medal winner. First minute, Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, I've never had a problem standing up to the alpha males in my own party. I wonder if the First Minister is able always to have said the same. And despite campaigning, in the Brexit referendum UK-wide, we'll the First soon. Minister now refuses to accept the result because she lost it. And she talks about principle. Well, let's talk about a matter of principle. I believe that if you ask people to make a decision, if you say to people that we will enact whatever you decide, then democracy is fundamentally damaged yep. if at the first opportunity you insist that vote is held again. Doesn't she see that? Doesn't she see that you shouldn't change the rules after the event? Yeah. First Minister. Well, if Ruth Davidson thinks that the views of the people of Scotland should always be respected, then why is it that she does not want the view of 62% of people in Scotland who voted to remain in the European Union respected? It was Ruth Davidson who told the people of Scotland that we had to reject independence to stay in the European Union and we now face being taken out against our will. So people in Scotland tomorrow do have that opportunity to send a very clear message, to send the message that Scotland does not want Brexit, Scotland did not vote for Brexit, Scotland wants to remain in the European Union. And Ruth Davidson. 
Presiding officer, we have enough common sense to see the contradiction of an SNP seeking to end a UK union in which we can dismiss the government over us while taking us into a far larger union in which we cannot dismiss anyone. Yeah. Not my words, the view of the former SNP deputy leader Jim Sillers writing at the weekend. And isn't he right? Isn't he right? that the SNP is a party that demands sovereignty for Scotland but who would trap us in a common fisheries policy and adopt the euro. It's a party that hasn't met a referendum that it doesn't want to overturn. A party that refuses to abide by the democratic decisions we all agreed that we would respect. Absolutely. Presiding officer, we have had enough of referendums. Scotland wants to move on. Why can't she see that? Yeah. First Minister. It's clear the Prime Minister doesn't necessarily think there's been enough uh, referendums, you know. Uh, we've had uh, Ruth Davidson's grovelling loyalty to the Prime Minister and her Westminster bosses. It must be so heartbreaking for Ruth Davidson to see none of that repaid as the Prime Minister has just torpedoed her pitch in the European elections. Uh, a pitch where she didn't have anything positive to say at the outset. But, you know, I think we see Ruth Davidson so desperate to cosy up to Boris Johnson uh, today that her conversion to a hard Brexiteer is complete. What people over the last three years have seen, of course, it is the power of small independent countries in the European Union. Small independent countries like Ireland. What a contrast to the way Westminster has treated Scotland. And that's why when people cast their votes tomorrow, I believe they will cast a vote to say to Westminster loudly and clearly, we don't want a Tory Brexit. We want Scotland to remain in the European Union. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, can I uh, refer members to my register of interest? Uh, presiding officer, three weeks ago, I raised with the First Minister a new Scottish TUC report entitled Broken Promises and Offshored Jobs. That report concluded that fewer than a third of the jobs promised in the renewable energy sector in Scotland have been delivered. So does the First Minister agree with me that in light of this record, it is even more essential than ever that the fabrication contract for the EDF Renewables Nyash Nagoya offshore wind installation is awarded to yards and workers in Scotland. First Minister. I fully support the trade unions um, in the campaign to bring contracts and jobs uh, to these yards. Clearly, it would not be appropriate for me to comment in detail on contracts that are not yet awarded. Uh, however, I think my support for BIFAB and for the renewable industry in Scotland is very well known. I think we have seen today one of the contrasts between this government and our counterparts in the UK government. It is because we intervened with BIFAB uh, that that company still exists today, able to compete for contracts. I want to see more of that work come to Scotland. That's why the Scottish Government convened a summit a couple of weeks ago, attended by the trade unions. It was very positive and we will continue to work with them uh, to make sure that as Scotland leads the world in the transition to a carbon zero future, uh, then people in Scotland benefit from the many jobs that will come with that. Richard Leonard. Uh, just last week, EDF boasted that they were creating 60 new office jobs in Edinburgh. But this is a renewable energy contract worth £2 billion, just 10 miles off the coast of Fife, that would generate over 1,000 green manufacturing jobs in Fife. Instead of which, it is reported today that EDF may be placing these contracts in Indonesia. According to the Scottish TUC, the transportation alone of these structures from Southeast Asia would generate carbon emissions equivalent to an extra 35 million cars on the road. And we are in a climate emergency. So what will the First Minister do to send a clear message to EDF that if it wishes to be part of Scotland's renewables future, it must stand by the promises made to these workers and to the communities of Fife. 
First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government sends a very clear message to all companies uh, letting contracts like this that we want to see Scotland treated fairly. And, you know, that message is unequivocal. As uh, I'm sure Richard Leonard will appreciate, it would not be helpful to anybody for me to comment further on the detail of uh, negotiations and decisions uh, that are ongoing. Uh, but the Scottish Government is acting here. Uh, we are acting in partnership with the trade unions. Uh, the summit I uh, referred to a moment ago after uh, that summit had taken place, Gary Smith from the GMB, Pat Rafferty from Unite, uh, said that they left the summit confident that the Scottish Government shares our determination to make sure we get a share of the renewables manufacturing bonanza and that they will take all necessary measures within their powers to do this. So we will continue to work with the unions and others, uh, also with the UK Government. Unfortunately, not all of the levers over this lie within our hands. Uh, but the Scottish Government took the action that we took uh, to save BIFAB because we do want to see it have a positive, prosperous future and we are determined to do everything we can to ensure that that is the case. Richard Leonard. Uh, well, the time has come to act. And when I raised this with the First Minister just 20 days ago, she responded by saying that, and I quote, meeting the targets of climate change will mean that we have to up our ambition and action across the whole range of government responsibilities. That also puts the responsibility on the shoulders of opposition parties. Well, this opposition party is shouldering our responsibility. And next Wednesday in Parliament, we will lead a debate on the future of BIFAB and the award of renewable energy contracts. We want to win cross-party support so that this Parliament can send out a united message that offshore wind must not mean offshore jobs. So will the First Minister back the Labour motion, support the trade union campaign, stand with the communities of Fife and stand up for these jobs. First Minister. I obviously haven't seen the Labour motion, but let me make an open offer to Richard Leonard today if he wants to talk to the Scottish Government about the terms of that motion so that we could come together and jointly back that, then I am more than happy for the Scottish Government to have those discussions. Um, because I think we should come together. Uh, the Scottish Government should be judged on our actions over BIFAB. BIFAB would no longer exist right now but for the action the Scottish Government took. Uh, the Scottish Government, of course, has a financial stake on behalf of the taxpayer in BIFAB. Uh, not only do we want to see it succeed for all the reasons Richard Leonard and others do, uh, but we want to see it succeed on behalf of the return to the taxpayer as well. So we will do everything within our power. We are already taking action in terms of the uh, discussions at the summit and we will work with anybody to make sure that BIFAB and other businesses in the renewable sector in Scotland flourish in the way that I think they've got every reason to expect to do. So I look forward to the discussions uh, between now and next Wednesday so that hopefully we can come together behind a motion that shows the support of this entire parliament for BIFAB and its workforce. A couple of constituency questions. The first from Jimmy Halker johnson the First Minister will be aware that a few nights ago, Elgin Mosque uh, was daubed with the swastika and offensive language on the outside of the building. It's not the first time that an attack of this nature has brought, been brought to the attention of this chamber, and I fear it won't be the last. But will the First Minister join with me and with politicians from across all parties in Murray in condemning this attempt to intimidate the Muslim community in Elgin? And will she give a clear commitment that the Scottish Government will ensure the resources are in place to protect Scotland's places of worship, and when they are targeted in this manner, that no stone will be left unturned in bringing those responsible to justice. First Minister. Um, can I wholeheartedly uh, echo the comments that have been made by the member? I know Richard Lockhead, as uh, the local MSP uh, for Elgin, has already expressed uh, similar sentiments. I unreservedly condemn any attack on a mosque or any other church or place of worship. I uh, suspect I have more mosques in my constituency than any other constituency um, in the country. Um, and I know the impact uh, on our Muslim community uh, of any attack or threat against uh, any of their mosques. Uh, and that applies, of course, to uh, anybody of any faith and any place of worship. I had the honour of addressing the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland uh, this morning. All of Scotland's faith have a very proud record in coming together and standing against intolerance, prejudice and bigotry, and we should all stand shoulder to shoulder with them as they do so. Joanne Lamond. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister share my grave concern at the deeply disturbing report in the Glasgow Evening Times revealing Police Scotland figures that there has been a very significant increase in sexual crimes in the city since 2013? And indeed, that in some areas, this has meant a doubling of sexual offences in five years, with all the suffering that brings. What reassurance can the First Minister give to the people of Glasgow that the city will have the police resources to address this deeply worrying trend and equally that there will be sufficient support to those who are the survivors of these sexual offences? First Minister. Well, any increase in sexual crime is of enormous concern and I would uh, echo Joanne Lamont's comments in that regard. Uh, some of the, uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting this is the case in the figures she cites, but some of the increase we've seen in sexual crime in recent years has come from the reporting of historic sexual crime and I think that is something that we should all uh, encourage. Uh, however, there are of course more police on our streets now than when this government took office and that is an important part of keeping uh, the people of Glasgow and people right across Scotland safe uh, and the police and all of us uh, should take tackling sexual crime extremely uh, seriously. We also must uh, do everything we can to provide support for survivors of sexual crime and through a whole range of different initiatives the Scottish Government does that and will continue to do so. Thank you. Question number three, Alison Johnson. Thank you. Um, I'm sure the whole chamber will wish to join me in extending my sincere sympathies to the family and friends of the cyclist who tragically lost their life in Glasgow this morning. Sustrans research out today tells us that children on bike or on foot in the most deprived areas of Scotland are more than three times as likely to be injured or killed on the roads simply as a result of their postcode. So it is clear that despite their very best efforts, a fragmented council by council approach to safer streets simply isn't working. Given obvious concerns about road safety, the government's own deadline for 10% of journeys by bike by 2020 looks more unachievable than ever. When will the First Minister take action? First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, can I also take the opportunity uh, to convey my deepest condolences to the family and friends of the cyclist uh, who tragically lost her life in Glasgow this morning. The tragic incident took place in one of the uh, busiest roads in my constituency, um, and I know it will have shocked uh, people locally, but I'm sure all of our thoughts uh, are with the women's loved ones. Um, in terms of the uh, wider question uh, that Alison Johnson has raised, of course, we have doubled the budget for active travel, and that is something we are committed to continuing. Uh, we did set out uh, the vision in the Cycling Action Plan for Scotland that by 2020, 10% of everyday journeys would be by bike. And there are some signs of progress in 2017, uh, for example, for commutes of five miles or under, 4% uh, of people cycled to work, but the proportion of Edinburgh residents cycling as their main mode of travel to work uh, increased from 6% to just under 10%, that increase being over the last 10 years. So we are determined to build on this progress to encourage cycling as part uh, of a commute, uh, which may also involve public transport. But this is an important part, of course, in our ambitions around keeping the population healthier, but also tackling climate change. Alison Johnson. Thank the First Minister for her response, but let's bear in mind that that budget that was doubled has increased from 1.5% to 3% of the transport budget. It is tokenistic. Reducing speed limits is one of the cheapest ways to make our roads safer for everyone. They're not safe enough. That's why currently 3% of journeys in Scotland take place on a bike. Now, the First Minister of Wales has announced that 20 miles per hour will replace 30 miles per hour as the default speed limit, mirroring the Members' Bill that is currently before this Parliament. Meanwhile, the Transport Secretary has rejected calls from SNP-led councils, including Glasgow and Edinburgh, to follow suit. Dozens of organisations, including the British Heart Foundation, the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, and the Poverty Alliance, back a default 20 mile per hour speed limit. With Scotland now lagging behind Wales, will the First Minister give the leadership needed to make our streets safer for everyone? First Minister. Well, firstly, I, I would say to Alison Johnson, I don't think uh, investment of £80 million a year, which is the active travel budget, is tokenistic. Um, I do understand that many people want to see that increase, and we will uh, continue to work hard to increase that uh, in light of the other budgetary pressures that we uh, face. In terms of 
Uh, speed limits, of course, Mark Ruskell's bill is currently before uh, the relevant committee for stage one scrutiny, and I will give a commitment today that we will consider the stage one report from the committee carefully when that is published. Uh, we've always been clear that 20 miles per hour speed limits are a good idea when implemented in the right environment, and you know, obviously the bill uh, has two different issues, which I think it is important to ensure are not conflated. The first is whether 20 mile per hour uh, speed limits are beneficial, and we certainly recognise that. The second point of course, is whether a blanket approach is the best way of achieving these desired benefits. And we will pay close attention uh, to the views of the committee when the stage one report is published. A number of um, supplementary questions. The first from Shona Robison to be followed by Liam Kerr. Shona Robison. Uh, today, a damning report on uh, UK government policy was published by the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, which on welfare reform stated the DWP had been tasked with designing a digital and sanitised version of the 19th century workhouse made infamous by Charles Dickens. While just published, perhaps the First Minister could provide her initial reaction and set out what the government is doing to tackle poverty. First Minister. Well, can I thank Shona Robinson for raising uh, this important issue? The, the report published today from the UN Rapporteur is shocking. Uh, and frankly, it should shame every member of the UK government. Uh, says things like much of the glue that has held British society together since the Second World War has been deliberately removed and replaced with a harsh and uncaring ethos. British compassion has been replaced by a punitive, mean-spirited and often callous uh, approach. Uh, I think those comments should make every UK minister pause and reflect seriously uh, on their welfare policies, on their austerity approach and decide to change course immediately. Uh, by contrast, uh, the report talks about the work being done by devolved administrations. It says that Scotland is spending £125 million per year to protect people uh, and has put in place ambitious schemes for addressing poverty. So we will continue to work hard to mitigate the impact of Westminster cuts, but also to build a system here in Scotland that protects people and is based on dignity and respect. Liam Kerr, to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Monday, Councillor Graham Campbell was woken up in the middle of the night. His car had been firebombed. The flames were spreading to his house and could easily have killed him and his family or spread to nearby homes. Now, I understand the First Minister cannot comment on live police investigations, but will she condemn this attack in the strongest possible terms? And does she agree that any threat or direct action made to politicians for simply carrying out their duties at any level and of any party is an attack on our very democracy and must be met with robust and decisive action. First Minister. Um, I, I condemn that incident uh, strongly, very strongly and unreservedly and I would take the opportunity to send my best wishes to Councillor Campbell uh, and to his family. I'm sure they were deeply shocked at what occurred. Um, as the member rightly says, I cannot and, and will not comment uh, further on the specific incident because it is, of course, a matter for police investigation. Uh, but I do think attacks on politicians of any nature are to be condemned. We live in a society where we should encourage and embrace a robust debate, uh, but we should try to conduct those robust debates in a civilised and respectful way. Uh, none of us in this chamber live up to that on all occasions, uh, but all of us should try harder to do so because our democracy and the people we serve uh, deserve no less. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Keith Brown. Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. In 2011, chaotic filing of documents relating to undercover police operations was followed by officers being sent to buy an incinerator in petrol, uh, taking documents to wasteland, then setting them alight. After a separate civil action and reporting by the Sunday Post, uh, the debacle is now considered serious enough to call in the Met for a further review. The Chief Constable says this recognises the need for public confidence in, quote, the vital area of covert policing. Does the First Minister agree with me, therefore, that a Pitchford-type inquiry into other alleged abuses relating to undercover policing in Scotland is also necessary to maintain that confidence? 
First Minister. Well, can I thank Liam MacArthur for raising this issue? As he said, an external police force has been asked to investigate the concerns that have been raised there. And I think the Chief Constable uh, is absolutely right to recognise the seriousness uh, of this and to take the action that has been taken. I think it would be wrong uh, in light of that for me to preempt the outcome uh, of that investigation. Uh, but uh, when it has concluded, I'm sure both the Chief Constable and if there are any uh, lessons or questions that are raised in that for the Scottish Government, that these will be uh, properly addressed at that time. Keith Brown, do you still... Yes, Keith Brown. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the First Minister whether she has uh, read the report on the extensive delays to the replacement system for airway for the emergency services, currently said to be at least £3 billion over budget in many years past its due date, in addition to the delays and massive cost overruns of Crossrail? Does this not prove that we should never let the Tories near infrastructure projects in Scotland? <laughs> First Minister. Well, the, the record of the Conservative Westminster Government in delivering infrastructure projects uh, on time, on budget, or indeed at all, uh, is not uh, a particularly strong one, by contrast, of course, to the uh, record of the Scottish uh, Government. Uh, Keith Brown is right to raise concerns particularly about airwave. There are, have been and will continue to be discussions between the UK Government and the Scottish Government on this issue. But the more responsibilities, of course, over uh, these matters that we hold in this Parliament, I think the better for all of us. And John Finney to be followed by Monica Lennon. John Finney. Serious public concerns about Scotland's fish farming industry, as highlighted by the Panorama programme the other night. And does the First Minister share the Rural Economy Secretary's view that we must, and I quote here, must be better at recognising and celebrating the good environmental credentials of this industry? When it comes to fish farming, First Minister, is it uh, um, growth at any cost? I don't think it should be growth at any cost in any sector of our economy. Uh, I do recognise the concerns uh, that people have about the environmental sustainability of aquaculture, its impact on uh, wild salmon in particular. We are committed to sustainable aquaculture and wild fisheries. Uh, both are dependent on the environment. Uh, aquaculture, uh, salmon uh, farming is important economically, but I think all of us would agree that it must be delivered and developed sustainably with appropriate regulatory frameworks which minimise and address environmental impacts. Uh, and I know that the industry uh, shares that view. Monica Lennon to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Monica Lennon. On Sunday, all opposition parties supported a campaign to stop processed meats containing nitrites from being served in schools and hospitals. Does the First Minister agree that nitro meats should be or should no longer be served in Scotland's schools and hospitals? And will she commit to a timetable to ending this? First Minister. Uh, there are, of course, international standards here that we will uh, fully comply with. Uh, we are absolutely committed to supporting the health and well-being of children and schools have a key role to play uh, to provide balanced, nutritious food and drink every day. And our regulations help to ensure uh, that this is uh, the case. Uh, following a review of the regulations, the Scottish Government consulted on proposed uh, changes, which included uh, a proposal to introduce a maximum level of red uh, and red processed meat served in schools. And we'll publish a consultation report by the end of this school year. And uh, Graham Simpson to be followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you. Uh, last week, the Scottish Land Commission uh, gave ministers its initial advice on um, land value capture. Can the First Minister say how the government plans to take forward this important work? First Minister. Uh, well, we welcome the report by the Scottish Land Commission. We are interested in more effective ways to capture land value uplifts to pay for enabling infrastructure. But as the Commission notes, this is a very complex area and any attempts to capture land value uplifts must be done in a fair way which doesn't impact on the availability of land for development or the supply of new homes. So we will consider the recommendations in detail and we will then set out our proposals to take forward work in this area following the completion of the planning bill. Jenny Mara to be followed by Maureen Ward. Jenny Mara. Presiding Officer, the First Minister will have read the interim report on mental health in Tayside. My thoughts are with all the families affected by this report and its terrible findings. The Mental Health Minister this afternoon announced another board of governance, but there are no actions to guarantee patient safety while we await the final report. 
Will the First Minister escalate NHS Tayside back to level five so the board has the support and supervision it needs to guarantee patient safety over the coming weeks? And will she also instruct NHS Tayside to halt mental health service redesign as David Strang recommended in his report, at least until his final report is published? First Minister. Well, in terms of patient safety, of course, the Healthcare Improvement uh, Scotland uh, report uh, also uh, addressed these issues and NHS Tayside, of course, uh, is undertaking uh, work in light of that. Uh, I want to take the opportunity today to thank David Strang for his interim report. It is an interim report, but it highlights a number of areas where there are clearly issues that must be addressed. And my thoughts, too, are with uh, all of the families that have been affected. Uh, NHS Tayside, uh, which commissioned the inquiry, have committed to learning from the interim report and we look forward uh, to David Strang bringing forward his final recommendations. Uh, the Mental Health Minister met with the Board Chair and Chief Executive uh, and the integrated joint board yesterday to seek assurances about progress in relation to improvement work uh, required and she has been clear in her expectations that the board and the IGB uh, that work uh, must be undertaken in Tayside to ensure the appropriate quality and standards of mental health services that this government expects and I want to reiterate that expectation today. Maureen Watt, to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Maureen Watt. Um, just over a month ago, First Minister, you wrote to the Prime Minister to call for greater involvement of devolved administrations in Article 50 negotiations. Can the First Minister confirm whether or not such a call has been reflected in the Prime Minister's new and improved Brexit deal? First Minister. Uh, well, as far as I'm aware, although I'll be corrected if I'm mistaken uh, about this, uh, there was no substantive response from the Prime Minister to that letter. Uh, Scotland hasn't been meaningfully consulted uh, at any stage of uh, this process. We certainly weren't consulted in advance of the Prime Minister making her speech uh, yesterday. Uh, Scotland, uh, the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament and the people of Scotland uh, more generally have been completely ignored in this whole sorry saga. And that's why I hope people in Scotland do tomorrow take the opportunity to send Westminster, uh, the Prime Minister, whoever he or she may be by next week, uh, a very strong message that Scotland doesn't want Brexit. Scotland wants to remain at the heart of Europe. And Maurice Corrie. Designing officer, having been privileged to visit our new aircraft carrier HMS Prince of Wales in Rosyth recently, I was very impressed with such a fine example of British shipbuilding and assembly skills in Scotland. This is a project where many of our armed forces veterans are working. What will the First Minister do to keep our veteran skills employed in this sector? First Minister. Well, of course, uh, the Scottish Government is doing a great amount of work to support our veterans, and I would take the opportunity to thank all those who serve in our armed forces and all those who have served in our armed forces. I also uh, am a strong supporter of shipbuilding uh, in Scotland, uh, and in the days when Govan Shipyard was in my constituency, it's now, of course, represented by Hamza uh, Yousaf, learned a lot about that proud industry. Uh, and, of course, one of the many things I regret about the independence referendum in 2014 uh, is the commitments made to the shipbuilding industry uh, by the Conservatives uh, have, like so many of their other commitments made back then, been reneged upon. And question number four, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the creation of 500 highly skilled tech jobs in Edinburgh by Lloyds Banking Group. First Minister. I warmly welcome the announcement of this new tech hub. It's yet another vote of confidence in the quality of the Scottish workforce and in the strength of our financial sector. Uh, with this announcement, Edinburgh is fast becoming one of Europe's most competitive tech hubs. Uh, we see uh, this through its growth in startups, offerings from its world leading universities and new digital academies like CodeClan, uh, which provide greater choice for careers in the industry. Uh, this is a significant step forward in the government's work to position Scotland as a vibrant and innovative digital economy. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the First Minister for that answer. As an Edinburgh MSP, I'm delighted our capital is becoming one of the most competitive tech hubs in the EU. These industries uh, especially uh, provide online financial services, benefiting greatly from the access to the EU single market. How will the First Minister seek to capitalise on growth in these sectors to create more jobs here in Edinburgh? First Minister. Uh, well, there is no doubt Brexit is a real threat. Uh, being taken out of the single market is uh, a grave threat to jobs in this sector, as it is a threat to jobs in many sectors across our economy. 
Uh, we are working in partnership with the financial services sector through, for example, the Financial Services Advisory Board, which I co-chair, to support its continued growth, not just here in Edinburgh, but across Scotland. Our development and skills agencies are actively engaging with the sector and professional bodies to support this. And our support for FinTech Scotland is a good example of how the Scottish Government is working with the sector, our agencies and our universities to drive growth and innovation in financial services and to attract investment and talent here to Scotland. Jimmy Halker Johnson. Uh, thank you. The announcement of potential new tech jobs is obviously welcome. Uh, and it's incredibly important that there is a pipeline of skilled employees to entering the sector. So can the First Minister comment on why financial services as a foundation apprenticeship is still available in only five of Scotland's 13 college regions, excluding my constituents in the Highlands and Islands? And given that reskilling into a technology career can cost over £6,000 per course, prohibitive amount for many people. Can she advise on what additional support the Scottish Government can provide for those looking to move into this sector? First Minister. Well, we continue to provide a range of support. I mentioned the Financial Services Advisory Board in my earlier answer, the last meeting of that, which took place um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, as has been the case at many of its meetings, was discussing skills and how we build the skills base in the sector. So there is a lot of work between government, uh, our agencies and the sector to make sure we're doing exactly that. I have to gently say to the member, though, uh, the biggest concern that is raised in this sector and in many other sectors uh, about the recruitment and attraction of skills is the ending of freedom of movement uh, that comes with uh, both Brexit and the Conservative government's uh, obsession with a hostile environment and cutting immigration. So we need to make sure that we have an immigration system in Scotland that continues to allow us to attract the best people, not just from within Scotland, but from countries across Europe and further afield. Question number five, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to promote active travel. First Minister. The Scottish Government doubled the active travel budget to £80 million in 2018 19. The majority of this funding is allocated to local authorities to deliver high quality walking and cycling infrastructure. Funding also includes more than £10 million to support local authorities and communities to deliver behaviour change programmes, including cycle training and increased access to bikes and e-bikes uh, to encourage more people to walk and cycle. Uh, last year, we appointed Scotland's first Active Nation Commissioner, Lee Craigie, as the national advocate for the benefits of walking and cycling, including for everyday short journeys. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the First Minister for that answer. She will be where that this is walk to school week. However, less than half of Scottish children walk to school and one in four parents is concerned about the impact of pollution near schools. The SNP government have fallen behind on reducing transport emissions and their target for increasing cycle journeys will not be achieved for an astonishing 239 years. Will the First Minister agree with the Scottish Conservatives and consider investigating the use of air quality monitors to give parents reassurance that their children are breathing clean air when walking to school? First Minister. We will continue to take action uh, to improve air quality through supporting councils with low emission zones, encouraging people to walk or to cycle instead of using their car, investing uh, in cleaner vehicles, uh, buses and uh, cars, investing in the technology uh, that supports that and of course investing in active travel in the way that I've set out. Uh, that is not helped by the kind of knee-jerk opposition we get from the Conservatives uh, to some of the policies to try to give councils more powers uh, to deal with these things. So uh, hopefully the member uh, will be able to prevail upon uh, her own uh, party colleagues to work with the Scottish Government to make uh, real progress here, which I think is now uh, within our grasp. And question number six, Pauline McNeill. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government, Government's response is to report that around one in five of Scotland's free-to-use ETMs are expected to introduce charges to customers in the next 12 months. First Minister. Uh, the ability to freely and easily access cash is essential, particularly for small businesses and those in our most vulnerable communities. That's why the Minister for Public Finance and the Digital Economy has repeatedly urged the Economic Secretary to the Treasury to appoint a regulator with sole responsibility for cash infrastructure. And we will continue to urge link and ATM operators to protect the ATM network to ensure that cash remains accessible to all. Polly McNeill. I thank the First Minister for that answer. She will be aware that the ATM industry body has warned that one in five ATMs could charge for withdrawals in Scotland within the next year. 2.7 million people in the UK rely wholly on cash for their daily lives. 
with 78 per cent of consumers in the two lowest household income groups relying on cash two to three times a week. So you can see the impact that this will have on the poorest communities. Does the Minister, First Minister agree that we should work cross-party, we should support our consumer guarantee for free access to cash, and we should also get behind the crucial work that MP Jed Killen is doing to legislate for this? First Minister. I'm very happy to work and cooperate cross-party on this issue. It is the case that cash payments remain an essential part of day-to-day -day life for many, uh, but especially for vulnerable consumers, uh, for smaller businesses and for those who live in our rural communities. Um, many of the levers here, of course, do lie with the UK Government, which is why uh, the Scottish Government Minister has uh, pressed the Economic Secretary to the Treasury, uh, supporting the WHICH campaign to ensure that cash does remain accessible to all. So we will continue to to press the UK Government and we look forward to having the support of parties across the Chamber as we do so. John Mason. Uh, thank you very much. I wonder if the First Minister would agree that as well as uh, um, charging for ATMs, it's uh, even worse when the ATM is removed altogether. And in fact, in my constituency, two of the eight branches are currently about to be closed by Santander and Clydesdale. Uh, the risk is that we also lose the ATMs completely from that area. And will she and the government continue their pressure on the UK government as far as possible to try and uh, put pressure on the banks? First Minister. Ongoing dialogue uh, with banks. Uh, they will say the pattern of customers changing, but we also point out that in many communities, including uh, the communities uh, that John Mason represents, people do rely on having access to uh, banks and indeed access to ATM machines. Uh, I know that John Mason and uh, his MP colleague David Linden are campaigning on uh, these bank closures and I wish them uh, well with that. So we will continue to have these conversations with banks and we will continue to press the UK government uh, to use the powers and levers at their disposal to get the fairest possible deal for consumers. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. First Minister, you said that you are concerned about the declining free-to-use ATM network in Scotland. If that's the case, why is your government the only one in the UK to charge business rates on post office ATMs? Because this is forcing many of them to close or introduce charges. First Minister. Well, firstly, this is an issue uh, that was raised uh, by the post offices that were in Parliament actually just last week, and it's one I've uh, given an undertaking to them that we will uh, look into. But I think, as anybody will point out, uh, there are a whole uh, multitude of reasons behind uh, the closures, and it's important that we address that in its widest sense. So where there are responsibilities of the Scottish Government, we will not shy away from those, uh, but we will continue to press the UK Government to take the action they can take to ensure a fairer deal for those who rely on banks and ATM machines. Bob Doris. The Cardtronics have imposed charges on two previous free-to-use ATMs in my constituency. It appears a dispute between them and Link explained the charges, which disproportionately impacts those on the lowest incomes. Will the First Minister offer her support to myself and Patrick Gray, the MP, as we seek to secure a meeting with the payment systems regulator and an attempt to eliminate these unfair charges? First Minister. Uh, the Public Finance and Digital Economy Minister met with the payment systems regulator in December last year to urge it to use its regulatory powers. So I, I certainly wish Bob Doris and Patrick Grady well in seeking uh, a meeting to press that case. Uh, the Scottish Government has asked the regulator to ensure that no ATM in a vulnerable vulnerable community closes until a new operator is found and that communities are not left without free access to cash as a result of links changes to interchange fees. Um, I welcome the support of members across the chamber in ensuring that the regulator is fully aware of the continued impact of ATM closures and charges on communities across Scotland. Thank you very much and that concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 17371 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. No one seems to wish to speak on this motion. Therefore, I call on Graham Day to move. Sorry. So the question is that motion 17371 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 17402 on a variation to standing orders. Could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move this motion? Uh, moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And this question will be put at decision time. Now, if no member objects, I'll turn to decision time a minute early. Anyone object? No one objects us. So, we turn to decision time. The first question is that motion 17360 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst on the business support inquiry be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. 
The final question is that motion 17402 in the name of Graeme Day on a variation to standing orders be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed and that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members business in the name of George Adam on concern for local radio content. We'll just take a few moments for members and the minister to change seats. <laughs>